Welcome to Speaker Night at the David Dunlap Observatory online with the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, Toronto Centre. My name is Denise Chilton and I am the RASC Toronto Centre DDO Committee Chair and an operator of the 74 inch or 1.88 meter telescope here at the David Dunlap Observatory. Together with our outreach coordinator, Quentin Weyrich, and our senior telescope operator, Chris Vaughn, I am delighted to be your host for tonight's lecture. I'm also very excited to welcome you, our viewers, to tonight's lecture. If you haven't already, please do take a moment to say hi in the YouTube chat and let us know where you are joining us from. This helps us to ensure that our technology is working properly uh, and it's great to know where everyone is connecting from. The Royal Astronomical Society of Canada's mission is to enhance understanding of and inspire curiosity about the universe through public outreach, education and support for astronomical research. In partnership with the City of Richmond Hill, RASC hosts outreach activities at the David Dunlap Observatory, or DDO. The observatory is home to Canada's largest optical telescope. It has been a site of rich research history and uh, I should mention here also royal history. We have had some royal visits in the past and I would like to just take this moment to acknowledge the passing of Queen Elizabeth II and our tr transition to a new monarch. I would also like to begin this evening by acknowledging that the David Dunlap Observatory in Richmond Hill stands on the traditional territories of the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe peoples whose presence here continues to this day. We would also like to acknowledge that this land is at the meeting place of two treaties, the lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit and those of the First Nations of the Williams Treaty. We thank them and other Indigenous peoples for sharing this land with us. It is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker for tonight's lecture, Dr. Leo Alcorn. Leo is a postdoctoral fellow at the David A. Dunlap Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics. Her research focuses on the properties of galaxies in galaxy clusters and how dense environments such as galaxy clusters and protoclusters affect galaxy evolu uh, evolution. In her free time, she is an amateur ballet dancer and writes short horror fiction. Fun fact, she has published two short horror pieces in the punk zine 979 represent. Tonight, Dr. Alcorn's lecture is titled Blowing Bubbles in Plasma, Galactic fountains at the centers of galaxy clusters. If you have any questions for our speaker, please do post them in the YouTube chat. Leo will have time to take your questions at the end of her talk. Please join me now in welcoming Dr. Leo Alcorn. Thank you so much, Denise. Hello, everyone, and thank you for having me. I love giving talks to, to RASC, so I was just thrilled to be invited to talk to RASC members again. My first talk for you is on the connections between Lovecraft and astronomy, but this talk will be on the subject of my research at the moment. This is the stuff I do every day, and this subject is, in my opinion, rather underknown among astronomy enthusiasts, even among professionals. 
while the subject is a bit esoteric, it involves, and it, it involves phenomena very distant from us, it is a particularly beautiful sight to behold. So trust me, I have lots of pictures for you. Uh, it's, it is also an area of very active research because we, there's a lot we don't know about galaxy clusters. But before I dive into the subject of these plasma and ionized gas fountains at the centers of galaxy clusters, I want to mention that even though I am giving this talk, astronomy is very much a team sport. And I've listed some of my collaborators here. We have astronomers in Toronto, Laval, Montreal, as well as collaborators with whom we have major collaboration in Taiwan. They look at merging clusters, we look at non-merging clusters, and we compare notes. I appreciate all my collaborators who have helped me understand this phenomenon. And we are very close to submitting a journal ar article on this subject. So let's get started. So I'm a bit of a nutter about galaxy clusters. It's to the point that I actually have two galaxy clusters tattooed on me. One right, if the, let's see, when it switches over to me, there's one right here and one right here. <laughs> so one right here. And well, two technically right here. <laughs> I'll talk about them more later. Uh, I have uh, here a picture of the galaxy cluster that I've been studying ever since I started working at University of Toronto. It's called Abel 2390, and it is located about 4 billion light years away from us. It is very, very distant from us, but close enough that astronomers like myself can measure what is going on inside of the members of this galaxy clusters, as we have the spatial resolution to do so. When I started in galaxy cluster studies in graduate school, I studied much more distant galaxies. And, uh, and, and uh, stuff that was barely formed. I was interested in learning about the very origins of these uh, clusters of galaxies and what, if any, effect they had on the galaxies that made up the cluster. But after I received my degree and moved to Canada to start my postdoc, I became much more interested in more evolved and older galaxy clusters because most of them are very, are very much closer due to how light has a speed limit. So the, closer I, uh, so the closer I look, the more evolved a galaxy cluster is. I like this because I like to be able to see a lot more detail in these clusters and actually be able to see the very fun processes such as gas being removed from incoming galaxies through ram pressure stripping. But in my studies, I neglected a very important part of these clusters, mostly because there's so much to study and understand that we simply don't understand yet. And I'm gonna to talk to you about this subject today. So to start out, what even is a galaxy cluster? Galaxy clusters are gravitationally bound groups of hundreds to thousands of galaxies. Uh, this is a picture of, um, uh, of the Virgo cluster, uh, which is our closest galaxy cluster. Galaxy clusters are held together by huge halos of dark matter, and that actually makes up most of the mass of the galaxy cluster. So this is our closest example, uh, which is uh, our closest galaxy cluster neighbor, neighbor the Virgo cluster. On the left, we see Virgo relative to us. You see that it forms a huge node among these filaments of smaller groups in isolated galaxies. They're not entirely together, but they're not, they're not entirely separated. So we in the Milky Way are not actually inside of a galaxy cluster. We are inside of what's called a galaxy group, which is much smaller. So our group is made up of us, Andromeda, and a number of dwarf galaxies that make, that make up our, our galaxy. So that's about a group size in comparison to a cluster, which is hundreds to thousands. On the right, we see the cluster. Uh, uh, on the right, we see uh, the cluster of uh, the Virgo cluster pointed out here uh, in optical light. Uh, so the holes from the, are, are from a camera and are not real. So as you can see, um, there, uh, and then there's a special cluster, sort of toward uh, the uh, the middle, uh, sort of sort of toward the uh, lower left. That cluster, that that galaxy is called M87. It's called the brightest cluster galaxy. And notice that most of these galaxies appear rather red. That's important later. So galaxies in, in clusters form a distinct population from galaxies not in clusters. So we, we notice that galaxies are redder. And when, when we actually look at what that means, redder galaxies means that these are older stellar populations. These are more evolved, older galaxies. These galaxies have less gas and therefore less star formation. Stars are not forming as quickly as galaxies like the Milky Way or Andromeda or isolated galaxies. Also, more heavy elements are in clusters and members of clusters. 
and they're more kinematically disordered. What that means is that rather than these galaxies having a nice rotation like our Milky Way or like Andromeda, so they're not rotating in a disk, they tend to be more chaotic masses of galaxies that are more spheroidal shaped. So because of that, um, I like to call these galactic necropoli. So the processes in clusters seem to shut off star formation. Uh, so we say that these are quiescent galaxies, or if you want to get all goth about it, uh, they're cities of dead galaxies. Also notice that in galaxy clusters, we see arcs in the image. This is caused by the literal warping of space time from how much dark matter is in this cluster. So what's going on here is you can see where I've pointed out some of these individual arcs. These are not actually what the galaxies are shaped like. These galaxies are actually behind the cluster and the warping of space time magnifies and elongates them. So it's, this isn't real. However, the magnification is very useful for if we wanna look at very, very, very distant galaxies behind this cluster. So because I'm so interested in clusters, I figure I'll show you my tattoo again. So I have a little bit of a galaxy cluster tattooed on me here. We have our uh, galaxies uh, in the cluster located here. And then we have our elongated lensed galaxies here. So let's see what happens when we add a little mass to the system. Urgh! Sorry, I had to do that joke. So another important part of a galaxy cluster is called the intracluster medium. The intracluster medium is a very hot gas, and constant turbulence. And it's so hot that it glows in the X-ray. So here we see the intracluster mediums of both the Virgo cluster and the Perseus cluster. This isn't invisible light, this is an X-ray light. So uh, if you looked at the galaxy cluster with your, with your eyes through a telescope, you wouldn't see this. However, that doesn't mean that it's not there. Uh, in fact, the hot gas actually makes up most of the matter that we understand within the cluster. So most of the matter in general is actually dark matter, but most of the matter that we understand is made up of atoms that we, that we sort of know what they are. That's this intracluster medium. There's also something called intracluster light uh, that is uh, sort of distributed among the intracluster medium. This is uh, formed from free floating stars. Notice that it's not smooth. There are holes in these. It's not, it's not a, a directly smooth um, uh, uh, medium. So it's, 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 that's something that's rather important that we're going to get to in a little bit. Sort of a special case though of the intracluster medium is something called the bullet cluster, which I also have tattooed on my arm. Um, this, is, this, this is not a single galaxy cluster. It's actually two galaxy clusters that are merging together. So what's going on here is that the pink light is the X-ray uh, is their X-ray light? So that's the bright hot gas that has just passed through each other. The dark matter is um, through weak lensing has been uh, marked in blue. So that's where most of the mass of the galaxy cluster is. And then the um, then what you would be able to see with your eyes. Uh, so the the stars and the galaxies themselves are in white and yellow. So this is actually a very important case of a galaxy cluster and the intracluster medium, because it actually shows that dark matter is the dominant form of matter in galaxies. So if dark matter wasn't there, most of the galaxies would be in the same area as the gas, because, most, because the gas makes up most of the mass of a cluster. So the galaxies would be gravitationally attracted to that gas. But instead you see that they're actually kind of separated from the, uh, from the pink areas. So that means that the galaxies are more gravitationally attracted to the, to the dark matter. So that means that most of this, of this galaxy cluster is made up of dark matter. It's one of the proofs that dark matter is real. So another interesting thing it tells us is that stars and dark matter are both non-collisional. They're kind of so far apart, not very dense, that they just sort of pass through each other when they collide, as you can see here, whereas, the gas does collide. The gas is sticky because you can see that on one end of the bullet cluster, there's a bit of a shock wave that forms to uh, on the right side of the picture. That's why they call it the bullet cluster. That's a shock wave forming. And it shows that the gas collides, it heats up, and sometimes even forms stars. So this is sort of a special case in a digression, but I can't help 
but show you the bullet cluster because it's a very important cluster. So at the centers of clusters, at the, and most of the times near the centers of the intercluster medium, they lay galaxies uh, just like M87 in, uh, in the Virgo cluster. These are called brightest cluster galaxies. So here's the Perseus cluster again, one of the uh, beautiful intercluster medium uh, images I showed you. This time focused on the area of the brightest cluster galaxy, or I might call it the BCG, but I'm going to try not to. Uh, <laughs> when you're a scientist, sometimes the jargon slips, slips in, and, and I try not to. So located close to the center and in the densest part of the intercluster medium is sort of a galaxy that looks a little bit like um, a firework, uh, um, kind of. So what's going on here is that in blue and in orange, you see galaxies that are associated with this galaxy cluster. And the pink is, is actually super hot gas. That's not stars. So what's going, what this points to is that there, these are interactions with this intercluster medium. And it's very hard to place a hard line between where the intercluster medium begins and the galaxy ends and vice versa. So these streams of color are coming off of where most of these stars and light are. They're coming outside of the galaxy a little bit, sort of merging with the intercluster medium. And this is something that I'm hoping to see in the brightest cluster galaxy of a, ga of a galaxy cluster that I am studying. So a little bit more about brightest cluster galaxies. These are the most massive galaxies in the universe. So this is an example. Uh, from uh, the closest galaxy cluster to us, the Virgo cluster. Uh, this is called Messier 87. So this, uh, as you can see, this is a monster galaxy. So it's big and it's orange. It's full of old dead, uh, old, old stars. And there's not a lot of star formation going on, but there's a little bit of a line coming out of it. Do you guys notice that? So that line is actually the, the, that that isn't stars. That isn't that that is a stream of light. That is what we call a jet. So the jets are actually where this bubble phenomenon that I'm going to talk to you about comes from. So these jets are created by supermassive black holes at the centers of these brightest cluster galaxies. All galaxies above a certain size host a supermassive black hole. But this one is much bigger than most. So this is the one in the middle of uh, Messier 87. This one is six and a half trillion times the mass of the sun. Imagine six and a half trillion suns with, uh, within um, 3.7 trillion kilometers. That's the size of the event horizon. It is uh, uh, 3.7 trillion kilometers wide. And there's an accretion disk that you can see lit up and it rotates around at nearly a thousand kilometers a second. This is what is powering those jets. So this is a nice picture from the Event Horizon Telescope. It was a very big deal when they got this picture of uh, this supermassive black hole. And uh, they named it uh, Powehi, uh, the Hawaiian word for adored fathomless dark creation. I find that just so lovely. Uh, again, as a horror fan, and an overgrown goth kid, I very much appreciate the naming for this. So this is an example of something called an active galactic nucleus. So active, uh, active black holes are black holes at the centers of galaxies uh, that are actively feeding on matter. So they're eating gas and dust. And, it's, uh, and from that, it creates these jets that's, uh, that spit out from this accretion disk. So you can see on the right, there's a bit of a structure. So there's a bit of a disk. The disk is where, uh, is where gas and dust and stars and any form of matter starts falling into that supermassive black hole. And from the, uh, the jets form outside of the disks, sort of uh, blasting out from, uh, the, uh, from the axis of rotation. And these are jets of plasma that uh, go outside the plane of the disk. The thing is, we're not entirely sure how the jets form. Um, and uh, that, that's a, an area of very active research. Now, the name of what we're seeing is called different things based on your viewing angle. So if you're viewing something from edge on, so if you're viewing a galaxy from edge on, 
We call that a radio galaxy or a Seifert galaxy. So you can see these two jets coming out from the, uh, from the sides. If you're viewing it uh, from an angle, we call that a quasar. That's actually what a quasar is. Um, and if, it's, if you're viewing right down uh, the center of that jet, we call it a blazar and it appears super, super bright. So let's see. So galaxies become active when their black hole consumes matter and they become quiet when the black hole isn't consuming dark matter. These are the bright centers of galaxies. Here's a picture here of an example of it. And it's very small compared to the rest of the galaxy. But um, the mass of a black hole is also very much correlated with the mass of the galaxy itself. So all, all galaxies above a certain size have a supermassive black hole, yes. But not all of them are active galactic nuclei, or AGN. So these can be hidden or they can be very bright. It depends upon your viewing angle and what in particular is making up this particular galaxy. Um, in the cases where we've been able to look into a galaxy deep enough, we have been able to see the accretion disk and the jets are, uh, are, are produced along the axis of rotation. Another interesting thing about these jets is that, that they, they sometimes appear to go faster than the speed of light. This is actually an illusion. So M87, so Messier 87, uh, the, the brightest cluster galaxy of the Virgo cluster, was actually measured to have jets that were traveling at four to five times the speed of light. This is called superluminal motion. And again, this isn't real. It is an illusion uh, uh, caused by the relativistic velocity of the jet. So two light pulses, so the interval between two light pulses emitted by the jet is seen by us as uh, is less than the actual interval due to relativistic effects. So this is due to the theory of special relativity. And be, uh, because the jet is moving close closer to us relative to us. So this results in a perceived faster than light speed. However, when we actually uh, account for uh, relativity, um, the, uh, the jet is only moving at 80 to 85 percent the speed of light. So fun, fun little fact about how these, uh, how, how these black holes can sometimes trick us. So they really are pretty, though. I wanted to show you just some, some lovely images of these jets. I think active galactic nuclei are such an underrated phenomenon in space. So here's two pictures of active galaxies or radio galaxies. The colored part is not what you would see with your naked eye. It is what you would see if you could see in radio. These are called radio lobes and they have a twin jet structure. So there's two of them, they spit out in two different ways. So these jets provide enough mechanical power to poke holes in the intercluster medium. So if you can see here, I've pointed out several of these holes in the Perseus cluster. This is because the jets are displacing uh, some, of the, uh, some of the gas inside of this galaxy cluster. And so that's part of what's making this not look very even. It's, what make, it's what's making it look denser in some places. So it appears to be filled with a number of curry, currents and eddies uh, and, uh, they're, they're, and there's more going on though. So notice these streams of pink again. This is, this is the, the same picture I showed you earlier. So this is the same cluster as this. So this is the uh, brightest cluster galaxy of the Perseus cluster. And again, you can see that brightest cluster galaxy looks a little bit like a firework. So notice the streams of pink again. These are actually associated with those holes in the intracluster medium. And I'll show you how actually. So. This is a lovely picture of, um, uh, of so uh, on the left, we see the, uh, uh, the intercluster medium in the X-ray. And on the right, we see just the, those little uh, firework streamer sort of things coming out of uh, the, the brightest cluster galaxy. And so you'll notice that if you look at the, the sort of streams, some of them seem to turn back on each other. And um, some of them seem to burst out even more. And if you actually overlay one on the other, 
you'll notice that some of these streams correspond with these holes. So just as an example, I'll show you. So this is, an ex uh, this is when we sort of zoom in on um, sort of the darkest hole here and one of those horseshoe-shaped streamers coming off of uh, the, um, uh, the gas image. So what we see here is that we see, so all of these contours, the sort of lines, they point out where the um, hydrogen alpha gas is. This is a hot, hot, hot gas. And that's sort of streaming off of this brighter cluster, of this brightest cluster galaxy. And what's going on here is that there seems to be some sort of bubble of gas forming inside of the intercluster medium. And in, uh, in the paper that sort of introduced this idea, uh, they uh, included a picture of an air bubble rising in water. And you can see that these currents of water look very similar to the currents of gas that form these gas bubbles. So that's interesting. So we started to call them bubbles because, you know, why not? So yeah, you can see the bubble here corresponds to the bubble here. So this actually, these bubbles rise buoyantly from the, from the galaxy itself up to the, uh, up to the sort of edges of the intercluster medium. Gas rises to, to uh, its highest point, but generally these can't escape. Why? Because these bubbles are not, um, the, there's a lot of gravity in a galaxy cluster. And it takes a lot of speed. You, um, it takes a lot of speed just to leave Earth. Um, this is due to something called the escape velocity. And the, uh, and the velocity of these jets and of these bubbles is just not fast enough to escape the gravity, the gravitational pull of this cluster. So all of the gas inside of that bubble will eventually fall back down onto the brightest cluster galaxy. And then that'll, uh, that'll eventually fall back onto the black hole and fuel another jet coming out. And so we call this sort of like a gaseous fountain or a galactic fountain. And what's going on is then uh, it takes this gas that was inside of this galaxy and distributes it through the intercluster medium, through the cluster itself. So what it does is it enriches the cluster with um, the products of star formation such as uh, extra heavy metals. Um, in, in astronomy, we call anything that isn't hydrogen or helium a metal because they're formed in stars. But these uh, get distributed through uh, the galaxy cluster through a process like this. So with that, let's get back to my galaxy cluster. So this is the cluster that I am studying again. And when I arrived at University of Toronto, uh, the uh, the person that I'm work with that I'm working with, uh, Dr. Howard Yee, wanted to point out that uh, there was a rather odd looking brightest cluster galaxy. So uh, this galaxy, uh, so these galaxies normally look like big giant ellipticals, big giant spheroidals. Uh, they're either spheroidal or oblong, um, but this galaxy looked a little different than I was expecting. It looked a little bit more like that Perseus cluster of galaxies, right? So. If you look closely, you can see a lot of blue and green little clumps. And that screams to me as an astronomer that there is nebular gas or hot ionized gas in there. So this is usually the product of star formation, which I said is much lower in galaxy clusters. So I wanted to know, is there actually star formation going on there? What's going on there? So I began, so, so I did my literature review and learned what I was telling you. And I found out uh, when I was doing my literature review that this galaxy had actually been observed many times before, quite extensively, and others had noticed this structure. So here I wanted to show you a Hubble Space Telescope image of this galaxy with some of the halo stars that drown out the light from the ionized gas lowered so that you can see the internal structure. I also reversed the brightness because so it's very hard to make out the structure of a galaxy when the denser parts are bright on a dark background. But when I switch this to dark on a light background, it's much easier for my eyes to determine the smaller and fainter shapes that we might have missed in the previous image. So the scale here is two arc seconds, showing you how very small this is looking compared to the rest of the, uh, compared to the rest of the galaxy that we've been looking at, because we're looking very, very, very far away in comparison to the other galaxy clusters we've been looking at. 
this is a very distant cluster. It's nowhere near us compared to, say, the Virgo cluster. So the scale here is two arc seconds. Basically, if you hold your hand at arm's length away from you, boom, and you, uh, your, the width of your pinky is roughly one degree. An arc minute is a 60th of your pinky. And an arc second is a 60th of a 60th of your pinky. So what we're looking at is very small on the sky. This is why the Hubble Space Telescope is so helpful and why James Webb Space Telescope is going to be so helpful when measuring structures of galaxies. Since you can see here that there's sort of a tail of clumpy stuff coming out from one end of the galaxy and an extended region across from it. I've also noticed that there appears to be two big clumps and a gap. And I had some guesses about what that could be. But before deciding, I needed some more information about what this galaxy was. Yeah, so clumps. Woo. So I was interested in what made up these structures. So I wanted to look at something called nebular emission lines. So those are what uh, sort of form those streamers in, uh, the, uh, in the Perseus cluster that I showed you earlier. So these nebular emission lines are very specific wavelengths of light that are released by certain atoms and molecules. These emission lines can tell me what is causing the light as well as the amount of whatever element is causing that light in the galaxy, how fast it is moving, where star formation is possibly happening. And they come about as a consequence of quantum mechanics, which says that different elements in a different quantized, AKA quantum packets of light. So we can measure these on telescopes. And so to measure this light, I got data using a telescope. Well, my, my team got data. I wasn't uh, just the only one. I needed more experienced astronomers to put in a good word for us. Um, so in particular, we, we, uh, we got data using a telescope called the Canada-France-Hawaii Telescope, pictured here on Mauna Kea. In particular, we used an instrument called SATEL, which is uh, above uh, where I put the picture of uh, the Canada-France-Hawaii Telescope. I think it's super cool because it is both an imager and a spectrograph. So not only do I get an 11 arc minute by 11 arc minute image of whatever we point at, I also get a spectrum at every single pixel. So then I can find these nebular emission lines rather than having them all blended together in a single image. So this spectrum is how I find those nebular emission lines. So on the left, we see an image of the galaxy cluster that we are studying, ABEL2390. Uh, the members of the cluster that we have confirmed are members of the cluster are circled in green. And you can see that there is a little bit of a pink uh, pentagon. That is where the brightest cluster galaxy that I am studying is located. So once I got that data, I extracted a map of the ionized gas in this galaxy, the hydrogen alpha light. And there was some additional structure to it. And uh, that, that additional structure, as you can see, there, there's a little bit of an extended edge to it. Um, and it looks a little bit like what I was, what I was expecting the Perseus cluster. Uh, it looked a little bit like the Perseus cluster, in my opinion. Additionally, there's a little bit of a, uh, so, so I called this uh, the cone. Additionally, there was a, a structure that sort of looked a little bit like that horseshoe shaped uh, uh, structure in the Perseus cluster that I know that I showed you earlier. So I called that the hook. So I took a look at that and compared it to the uh, to the Hubble Space Telescope image in optical light, and I noticed that they didn't quite align perfectly. So I thought that was very interesting. Um, and there's there's perhaps more to that. Um, so a little bit more on that. So yeah, again, it looks like what I was expecting that uh, that brightest that brightest cluster gal galaxy of Perseus to look like. So you can see a little bit of those streamers, and you can see my little cone. So I was able to extract a bunch of different neb nebular emission lines. Um, these are different elements as well, and these all these elements can tell me certain things, like what is causing that light to form. So um, I was able to measure uh, hydrogen, I was able to measure nitrogen, I was able to measure oxygen, and I was able to measure a few, uh, a, 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 uh, another uh, atomic transition of hydrogen. 
And these uh, actually told me some very interesting things about uh, what is fueling this light. So I was wondering, is there star formation going on here? And the answer was yes, but that's not the only thing that's going on. There's a mixture of things that are causing this light, both from the motion and the interaction between the ICM, the, the intercluster medium, and the uh, and star formation going on within this tail, which explains all the clumps that are forming in that tail. So I was wondering, actually, I'll go back. I was wondering if this thing actually is like the Perseus cluster, I should see some big radio lobes because the Perseus cluster is fueled by an active galactic nucleus which produces radio jets. So I should see them, right? And, uh, and I should see these, uh, these holes in uh, the intercluster medium. So I actually found uh, somebody who had looked at this galaxy cluster before, and they, they actually found these, these holes, as you can see in, uh, on the right side and on the left side. This is a uh, X-ray image, just like um, the Perseus cluster that we saw earlier here. And there's holes. However, it's not quite as pretty because it's a little bit farther away. So our spatial resolution isn't quite as good. Um, additionally, we saw a number of these holes. And interestingly, I saw that there was a uh, northwest cavity uh, in the uh, intercluster medium. It's a bit smaller than the other cavities. And it aligned with a surface brightness edge that you can see on the right image. So that's where all of these arrows are pointing to. So I thought that was interesting. So clearly there, there must be some sort of bubbles forming because otherwise you wouldn't get these cavities inside of the, uh, inside of the intercluster medium. How, uh, and I should also see radio lobes. So I looked through the literature again and I did find that there were big radio lobes. So this is an image of the cluster again, except the contours, the white lines, are where the radio is. And you see these big, big jets forming and uh, they're on opposite sides. In fact, this is a bigger uh, jet. Uh, this, is, this is one of the bigger uh, radio lobe sources that have ever been seen. So here's another image of that. So everybody was pointing out, oh yeah, there's these two big radio lobes coming out of this object. However, my, my boss and I noticed that nobody was pointing out this sort of third area of very strong um, radio uh, emission. Whereas uh, the radio lobes, the two lobes that everybody had pointing out, was pointing out were actually quite a bit fainter. So in this image, when everything gets bluer, that means that it's fainter. When things get redder or um, green or yellow, they're actually a bit more dense. So there's actually more radio coming out of that area. So I thought that that was actually quite interesting. So I put everything together. So a number of astronomers did a lot of work in this, but nobody had actually put together a whole picture of this galaxy cluster. So I did. And basically what we see here is we see a high nebular gas region, which in the, uh, in the inset is in, uh, is in red. That's where the ionized gas is. And that actually corresponds with that high radio region, which is what's in purple. There is an X-ray cavity associated with it. And there's X-ray cavities associated with in orange in the inset, some very powerful new small radio jets. And basically what I think I found is that the big, big fading uh, radio lobes in dark red are perhaps a very, uh, um, they're, they're a previous outburst of the active galactic nucleus. And I think that what we're seeing is that hydrogen alpha tail might be either an older, uh, a, uh, an outburst that's no longer going on, but is more recent than these older lobes, or we might be, be finding a galactic fountain. So this is where this, this new region, perhaps, uh, that, that we found uh, with uh, the hydrogen alpha is perhaps falling back onto the galaxy and then fueling this new jet that's forming in orange, which is the newest jet. And there's cavities that are associated with all of them. So that's me putting it all together. So 
I'll summarize here. Brightest cluster galaxies are unique galaxies. They're special galaxies. They're some of the biggest galaxies in the universe, and they host some of the biggest supermassive black holes. Supermassive black holes can produce huge, huge jets, radio jets of plasma interacting with all of the hot gas that uh, forms around these galaxy clusters. So these can create cavities within that intercluster medium. These cavities are huge bubbles of gas, and the gas isn't moving fast enough to escape the gravitational pull of the galaxy cluster, so it falls right back down again, which then feeds the black hole of the center and then causes another AG, uh, active galactic nucleus outburst. So that is what we call a galactic fountain. And I think I found one, but I need to wait for peer review to decide whether I actually did. <laughs> So I'll leave you with some uh, images of uh, some of my favorites of these uh, radio lobes because they they really are truly beautiful. And uh, from here, I can take questions from the audience, uh, if any or if anybody wants to comment on it, or just even nerd out about how beautiful this uh, these objects are. So thank you so much for having me, and I hope you found this as interesting as I do. Wow. Thank you so much, Dr. Alcorn, for sharing this incredible look into the depths of galaxies with us. Um, we are going to check in now with our RASC DDO Outreach Coordinator, Quentin Weyrich, who has been monitoring the YouTube chat for questions. Quentin, over to you. Hi. Thanks so much, Denise. Uh, Dr. Alcorn, it does not appear that there are any questions from the audience, but I just want to say this was an absolutely fascinating talk, and uh, these are some beautiful structures. Thank you so much for coming on to talk with us today. I, I know. I'm, I, it is so great seeing them. Thank you so much for nerding out with them with me. Yeah. It's, it, it, it almost reminds me a little bit, and perhaps this, is a, perhaps this is unjustified, but this like repetitive cycle of these fountains forming reminds me a little bit of solar flares, but obviously on a much larger scale. Um, I, I think I think that's really interesting. Yeah, it is. And um, there's actually a, a somewhat similar phenomenon um, when you look into the disks of galaxies. It's not exactly the same because it's not fueled by um, these supermassive black holes. But sometimes when, uh, say, um, uh, a supernova happens, the, that uh, something very similar can happen because uh, a bunch of uh, uh, material is ejected outside of the plane of the galaxy and then it can fall right back down onto the galaxy. We think that this has happened actually in the Milky Way a few times, but uh, it doesn't necessarily happen in the centers of galaxies. And uh, that happened, uh, that's rather similar to uh, what you were talking about with the solar flares because it's happening on a stellar um, uh, uh, scale. So this isn't just um, uh, something that happens uh, just because of black holes, it also happens because of stars. Uh, so when stars die, when stars explode, you can get a, a, another type of fountain which then makes other types of stars, and then it can happen all over again. Excellent. Uh, we actually do have a couple questions from the chat. Oh, fantastic. Uh, Tom, Tom Vassos asks, uh, if, you, if it would be possible for you to point out the shockwave uh, in the bullet cluster image a little bit more clearly? Oh, absolutely. Uh, let me see. I'm not sure whether, um, actually, let me uh, go back to the bullet cluster. Here we go. So let me see. Can you see? Yes. All right. Oh. All right. Can you see my cursor? I can. OK. So I'm pointing out where the shock wave is. So this is, um, so what's happened is that this galaxy cluster here has passed through this galaxy cluster, and it's ripping all of this gas off. And look at that, it's almost like a beautiful, perfect shaped bullet shock wave here. So isn't that quite lovely? If, you, if um, anybody doesn't see my uh, cursor, it is on the, um, uh, the right side of the image. It is the pink um, object uh, that uh, looks like um, sort of a V or a U on its side. So hopefully that makes it clear. And I don't have the uh, the numbers on me, but from that, you're actually able to determine how quickly these things are merging. So I'll, I'll leave this up because it's very pretty. Yes, it is. Um, we have a we have another uh, we have a couple more questions from the chat. Um, 
Ellen Karim asks, uh, what are the stars? This is more of a, I, I suppose, a fundamental question. What are the stars? Yeah, what are they? What are, I, I, I imagine uh, they're asking, you know, like, what are they made of? Um, oh, what yeah. Are, like, what fundamentally are they? Oh, uh, stars are big balls of burning gas. I think Pum, uh, Pumbaa from the, the Lion King put it best. Uh, they're big balls of burning gas billions of miles away. But um, basically what's going on is that they're big balls of hydrogen. So, and this, this hydrogen is compressed uh, into uh, the core of uh, this. Uh, so it's a, it's a big ball of gas pretty much. And in the core, it gets so dense and so hot that the hydrogen smashes together. And when it smashes together, it creates helium because hydrogen is pretty much just a proton because it's moving so fast. Uh, the electrons are just sort of moving around randomly because hydrogen is not technically in a pure gaseous state. It's kind of a plasma. And uh, when it smashes into another, it forms helium. And uh, also energy is released. So this is nuclear fusion. The nuclear fusion releases energy. And that's actually how we get light and warmth. And that's actually what lets us survive. So that's why the sun is amazing. And the sun is a star. And that's how stars work. That's a great, that's a great explanation, I'd say. Uh, we have another question, um, also from Tom Vassos. Are they pretty certain that it is the magnetic field that has something to do with the formation of relativistic jets? Um, anything else? Oh, God, I am not entirely sure, but that seems like the best guess. Um, the thing is, um, it's sort of a joke among astronomers that um, magnetic fields are still an area of very active research. And it seems pretty likely that they would be forming these um, these uh, uh, these relativistic jets. But uh, I think that we haven't like nailed that in yet, if you know what I mean. I see. That, that makes sense. There, it's, it's certainly an exotic environment. <laughs> yes, there is a lot going on. Uh, and um, also, uh, if you look at, actually, I'm going to show you um, the event horizon. Um, yeah, so this, uh, this image taken by the event horizon telescope. So you can see that uh, there's sort of these, these curves coming out. And this, that's due to the polarized light. So that sort of points out to me that there's some, some electromagnetic activity going on or some magnetic activity going on. So I don't think that that's an unreasonable guess of what would be causing these uh, these jets. So I just wanted to point that out as well. OK, uh, I believe this is the final question from the chat. Uh, why would the gas be emitted by a black hole if that is indeed what happens and not a star or planet, uh, referring to these large relativistic jets that we see in the galaxy clusters? OK, so there's only so much that a black hole can eat at once, actually. <laughs> um, so that's because stuff, stuff sort of crowds around a black hole. And eventually, so much stuff starts falling in that it can't all fall in at once. So some of it is ejected. And uh, at, at least that's what we think creates the jets. But uh, this is due to something that is called the Eddington luminosity. It's sort of the maximum amount of stuff that can fall into a black hole at once. And that depends upon the size of the black hole, mostly. All right. Thank you. <laughs> um, one more question, uh, more okay. of a personal question. How did you get interested in astronomy? And do you have any advice for uh, other young people who are getting into it, into astronomy? OK, so I got into astronomy um, when I was uh, I mean, I, I was very interested in astronomy when I was very young um, because uh, my my parents got a uh, telescope and they wanted just uh, be, when the Hale-Bopp comet came. I was a kid when the Hale-Bopp comet came and they wanted to take a look at it. And um, we looked at more than the Hale-Bopp comet, I tell you that. Um, I was actually quite fascinated by Saturn, enough that I had it tattooed on me as well, my favorite planet. Um, but uh, I was able to see the, uh, the shadow of uh, the rings on Saturn, and I thought that, that was just so cool. But I didn't go into university uh, to study astronomy. I actually went into university uh, to study fermentation science at first, because I wanted to start a brewery. Um, but I took a, um, uh, I, I took a, an astronomy class for fun and, um, I learned actually something, uh, very interesting. I'm, I'm going to show you all, uh, one second. 
Yeah. So when we were looking at um, the galaxy cluster, and I was talking about uh, those arcs uh, that, that we see here and here and here, that I learned about gravitational lensing then. So how space-time literally warps due to just how much dark matter is in these galaxy clusters. And I thought that is so cool. Space actually does that and we have pictures. Oh my God, I need to change my major. So I changed my major. Um, and uh, so the advice that I have for anybody who's interested in astronomy is, I didn't think I was smart enough to be in astronomy because I wasn't a math whiz and I'm still not a math whiz, but um, it, there's no such thing as someone who isn't a math person. It just depends on how much work you're willing to put into it. So if you're interested in astronomy and want to do it as a career, uh, just be willing to give it a try. Give the math a try. It may be hard, but the more you practice it, the easier it'll become. And it's okay to make mistakes. Um, so that that's okay. And if you don't want to do it as a career, then you can join things like RASC and, and still keep learning. Uh, there's uh, there's a lot of space for um, people who uh, are very interested in astronomy and want to contribute to research but don't want to make it their whole um, their whole career. Um, look at um, something called uh, Galaxy Zoo. Um, they 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 need uh, people to take a look at these objects. Also, you can get very good with a telescope. Um, I've seen uh, non-professional astronomers who are way better at working a telescope than any professional I've seen. Um, so uh, just just be curious, be open. Uh, the universe is a wonderful, beautiful place, and just come at it with an open heart. <laughs> Great advice. Thank you. We do have uh, another question from the chat now. Mm -hmm. uh, Melissa Miles asks, thanks for your presentation. Can a black hole eat a whole galaxy? Oh, God. I don't think we've actually seen that before. But, I mean, theoretically, it could. Theoretically, it could. Um, I don't think we've ever seen that, though. Um, Not all at once, right? Because of the Eddington limit oh, that no. you were talking about before. Yeah, yeah. The Edding, yeah, the, the, yeah, there is an Eddington limit. But um, I, I don't see how that could happen based on um, most of these galaxies. It's so say a supermassive black hole at the center of a galaxy probably couldn't eat the whole galaxy because something can't fall into a black hole unless it's within its event horizon. And its event horizon is very, very small compared to the rest of the galaxy. So while something like these jets will affect the galaxy as a whole, it's not due to anything falling in. So if you're, say, worried about um, the uh, black hole in the center of the Milky Way eventually sucking us in, that's probably not going to happen. We would need to somehow be moved very, very close to that black hole for it to harm us. Good answer. Thank you. I believe that concludes the questions from the chat. Thank you so much, Dr. Alcorn, for speaking with us. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, everybody, for the questions. Thank you, Quentin, for relaying all of these great questions from our audience. Thank you so much, Dr. Alcorn, for answering them and sharing your amazing insights into these galaxies. Best of luck with the peer review process. I hope that your research goes really well. Um, we do have a little bit more on our program tonight. This would not be a DDO online event without a tour of the DDO. And although RASC is not yet welcoming the public back to the DDO facility, we do have a short video tour prepared for you. We will come back after the tour with some live views from the big scope behind me and uh, for any questions you might have about the facility or the telescope. Hello and welcome to the David Dunlap Observatory. Behind me is Canada's largest optical telescope. My name is Denise Chilton and I am a rascal, a member of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, Toronto Centre. It is my pleasure to be an operator for this telescope, and tonight I'm going to give you an inside look at this telescope and how it works. But first, let's think about the history of this scope. This facility opened in 1935. 
Originally, it was a research telescope for the University of Toronto. It was named in memory of David Dunlap, who had thought that he was going to provide some funding for the construction of this scope, but his unfortunate death prior to that funding being secured put the future of the scope in jeopardy. It's very lucky that his widow, Jessie Dunlap, came forward to donate the funds for this facility. The telescope was built by Grubb Parsons in England, uh, in Newcastle on Tyne, in 1932 and 1933. It was shipped across the Atlantic in pieces after being completely built and assembled and then disassembled in England. It was shipped here um, and rebuilt on this site and it opened in 1935. It was in use as a research telescope for many years, but unfortunately due to light pollution um, and the availability of bigger and better research telescope facilities, the University of Toronto closed this telescope in 2008 and the property was eventually sold to the city of Richmond Hill. The good news is that the telescope is now open for public tours. Unfortunately, with COVID, we can't have people in the building, but tonight it will be my pleasure to show you how this telescope works. So how does a telescope work? Well, a telescope points outside at the night sky. Light flows down the optical tube, light from moon or stars or planets or dark sky objects. And it's collected by the great big mirror behind me. This is the primary mirror in the telescope. In this case, this one is 74 inches across, or 1.88 meters. You can probably see my reflection back there behind me. And it's this diameter that makes this telescope so powerful at collecting light and at being able to see very distant objects. When this facility opened in 1935, this became Canada's largest optical telescope, taking that record from the Dominion Astrophysical Observatory in Victoria, British Columbia. Their mirror is only 72 inches in diameter. Rumor has it that when Dr. Clarence Chant, who commissioned this telescope, placed the order for this mirror, he asked specifically for it to be two inches bigger than the Dominion Astrophysical Observatory's telescope mirror so that he could have the record of the largest telescope in Canada. When this opened, it was also the second largest telescope in the world. No longer the case, of course, as much larger optical telescopes have been created since then. To get back to how a telescope works, Light flows in from the night sky outside and is collected by this great big primary mirror and bounces back in that direction toward you. I'm not sure if you can see this uh, contraption at the top end of the telescope here. This is the secondary mirror attached to these veins. The secondary mirror collects the light from this primary mirror and sends it back down the telescope to the hole in the very center of the mirror. This hole leads to an eyepiece down below. And that's where you, if you were here, could come and look through the telescope and see distant planets, distant stars, or dark sky objects. You might have noticed that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. If you were to stay up all night, you might notice that all of the objects in the night sky do the same. The moon, the stars, the planets, and more. This is because the Earth is rotating. But what this means is that the telescope needs to be able to lock on to night sky objects and then track them across the sky as the Earth rotates. So we have some controls over here that allow us to lock onto our targets. Every object in the night sky 
has a set of coordinates. We call these coordinates right ascension for east to west and declination for north to south. These are the same as latitude and longitude coordinates for objects on Earth. Let me show you how our controllers work. This is our declination controller. It helps the telescope move north to south. Let's watch how that works. As the telescope is moving north, we can see the coordinates in the counterweight on the other side of the telescope, so we know exactly where it's pointed. Now that we have our declination coordinates locked in, north to south, we're going to lock in our right ascension coordinates, east to west. We use this wheel to do that. First, we unlock the telescope. And then we can turn the wheel, and our coordinate system is up here on the setting circle so that you can see where uh, the telescope is pointing exactly. And we turn the wheel until it's pointing in the right direction. Once the telescope is pointed in the correct direction, we need to lock it in place again so that it doesn't swing around. But you might have noticed that the telescope is no longer pointing at the open sky. Instead, it's pointing at the inside of the dome. So we need to rotate the dome roof to bring the open window in front of the end of the telescope. The dome weighs 80 tons. It, it rotates on a set of 24 train wheels connected to a cable and pulley system powered by a motor downstairs. Once the open shutters are in position, we're ready to start observing the night sky. Just up this ladder, we can find our way to the eyepiece. I wonder what I'll see tonight. Thanks for joining us for this virtual tour of the David Dunlap Observatory. We hope to see you here in person as soon as we're able to reopen the facility for public tours. Until then, wishing you clear skies. I hope you enjoyed that tour of the facility and that this glimpse at the, at the David Dunlop Observatory inspires you to come visit us uh, to learn much more about its rich research um, contributions and its history. If this tour is not enough to pique your interest uh, to, in visiting the DDO, we are going to go now to a live view from the 1.88 meter or 74 inch telescope, which is right behind me. We should have coming up on your screen momentarily, a beautiful view of a double star. And we have Chris Vaughn now on the line who's going to tell us all about it. Chris is our senior telescope operator here at the DDO. Chris, over to you. Thanks, Denise. So the star you're looking at here, the brighter of the two, is the star Sheliak. Sheliak's name comes from the word for tortoise because it's one of the stars in the constellation of Lyra. Lyra's the harp and uh, used to make harps out of tortoise shells long ago. If you head outside after the program tonight and look straight up in the sky, you'll see a very, very bright star. That's Vega. And just below that is a parallelogram of four dimmer stars. And the whole constellation almost fits into the field of binoculars if you have any of those handy. Sheliak is one of the stars at the bottom corner of the parallelogram. Now this star is actually an eclipsing binary star. So there are actually two stars in the view. So the brighter star is a pair of stars so close together that they look like just one star. And then there's a companion sitting at the bottom of the screen that's a little bit fainter. Now in binoculars or a backyard telescope, you can see both of these stars, the bright one and the dim one. But what's really interesting is the, is the brighter upper star. So that star actually varies in brightness by doubles and halves its brightness every 13 days. And what you can do is you can compare that brightness of that star on any given night to the stars in the other two corners of the box and see whether it's near its maximum or its minimum. The reason it's varying in brightness is because it's actually two stars so close together, they're practically touching one another and they're orbiting with an orbital plane that's edge on towards Earth. 
And when the two stars are side by side from our point of view, we get the light from both. And when the stars are kind of lined up from our point of view, one star's light blocks the other and it's the whole system drops in, drops by half. They're about 880 light years away. So head on out, take a look, grab your binoculars and take a look at Sheliak in the nighttime sky. Thank you so much, Chris, for that amazing information about the star system. What a wonderful view from the 74 inch telescope. Now, I have been told that there are some questions in the chat about the DDO facility. So I'm just gonna consult that. Um, Ellen Kareem asked if that tour video was recorded today. No, it was not. Um, that tour video was recorded in the daytime, uh, quite some time ago, actually. But believe me, our telescope has remained unchanged for many years. So it is still functioning exactly as you saw it in that video, except instead of an eyepiece at the top of that ladder, we have a camera mounted. And that is how we are bringing you that beautiful live view from the telescope. If there are no other questions, I don't think there are. Um, I did just want to also mention one of, the one of the great questions that was asked to Dr. Leo Alcorn was about what stars are. And uh, she gave a wonderful answer, but if anybody would like to learn more about stars, you should definitely join us for one of our Sunday sun gazing events because we take a look, a very close look, at our closest star, which is of course the sun. So stay tuned for details on when that is coming up. Okay, so on behalf of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada Toronto Centre and the RASC DDO Committee, I would like to thank Dr. Leo Alcorn for an amazing look at galaxies and galaxy clusters uh, this evening. Thank you also to our technical support team, Andrew Reed, Betty Reed, um, and of course, thanks to Quinton Weyrich for taking questions from the YouTube audience and um, to our senior telescope operator, Chris Vaughn, for not only running our big scope, but also telling us about the target we observed tonight. A special thank you to all of our viewers for joining us this evening and for your wonderful questions. This talk is part of our 2022 season of astronomy events at the David Dunlap Observatory Online offered through the partnership of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada Toronto Centre and the City of Richmond Hill. Our upcoming events include um, Sunday Sun Gazing on September 11th actually is our next event. Um, and we will have another one, I think, in October as well. We have an Up in the Sky event coming up September 16th and another one on October 7th. During these events, we have RASC member telescopes and, of course, if the weather is clear, the 74-inch telescope in operation, and we bring you live views from those and talk about the galaxy and the solar system and things that you can observe in the night sky. We have Ask an Astronomer coming up on October 2nd. This is your opportunity to have a sit down with our senior telescope operator, Chris Vaughn, and ask him any questions that you have about astronomy. He also does great previews of things to look for, um, you know, month to month and lets you know what kinds of things you can observe for yourself. And of course, our next speaker's night is October 14th. So stay tuned for details on that. All of these events and more are posted on our website, rasco.ca. So please do have a look there for more details. We are hoping that tonight's event has you excited about trying astronomy for yourself. So to wrap up the evening, we have some tips to help you give it a try. Please enjoy this video on getting started in astronomy and wishing you a wonderful night and clear autumn skies. A question we're often asked is how do I get started in astronomy? It's a really great hobby, especially in this COVID context. It gets you outside for fresh air. You don't need to do it in a group 
and there are tons of free resources online. So here's a quick guide to getting started in astronomy. Step one is to learn the sky. This really is essential as it's important to be able to orient yourself and know what you're looking at. There are lots of resources to help you with this. If you prefer books, I can recommend Night Watch by Terence Dickinson or The Beginner's Observing Guide by Leo Enright. Or if you'd like to print out some star maps and star finders, there is the star finder from the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada that's a printable star finder that you can take out with you under the night sky. Or you can print sky maps and sky atlases from skymaps.com. If you're a little more tech savvy and you prefer programs and apps, I recommend Stellarium. This is free planetarium software you can install on your home computer. Or Sky Safari. This is an excellent app for your phone. Once you've got your bearings, step two is to start observing. That's right, just head out under the night sky and look up. You don't need any special equipment, just your eyes. With your eyes, you can see things like constellations and asterisms. These are the formal and informal patterns that stars make in the night sky. You can see planets like Mars um, and several other planets as well. You can see the moon and observe its different phases as it moves across the sky. You can see meteor showers, comets, and even one galaxy that's bright enough to see with your naked eyes in a very dark sky area. Maybe you're inspired to look for more than what you can just see with your naked eyes. So step three is it's time to start collecting some gear. Now, you might be surprised that you may already have some of the things you need lying around the house. If you have a pair of binoculars, you can point those at the stars. If you don't, they're a small investment with a lot of benefits. With binoculars, you can see details like craters on the moon or the phases of Venus and the moons of the planet Jupiter. You can even see smaller, fainter asterisms and double stars. Remember, one of our famous astronomers in history, Galileo, started out by using a telescope that didn't have much more magnifying power than an average pair of binoculars. His contributions to astronomy are remarkable, and you can see a lot through your binoculars too. If you're ready to get a little more serious about your astronomy hobby, you might consider investing in a telescope. A small amateur telescope is a big investment, but with more magnification possible, you can see more detail on the surface of planets, the moon's craters, you can see many double stars, some galaxies, and nebulas, and other deep sky objects. I recommend joining the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada to participate in the telescope loan program if you're interested in buying a telescope. You'll have an opportunity to try out many different scopes and determine which one is best for you. And this brings us to step four, connect to a community. You can find information about the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada Toronto Centre online at rasco.ca. And through RASC, you can learn about upcoming astronomy events, you can find more astronomy resources, and you can become a member of the club for additional benefits, like that telescope loan program I mentioned. I hope this guide has helped you to feel confident in getting started in astronomy. Enjoy those clear night skies.